Hello everyone, it's Tim Lineman again. Um, for back for more video lectures for critical reasoning. This is the part two video um, for the inductive arguments um, unit. And I wanted to start by uh, giving this sort of mini lecture thing um, about uh, statistical generalizations that I was promising last time. Um, and then we'll go on and probably talk about um, statistical applications. But uh, usually when I'm in the classroom, I'll, uh, when I'm lecturing, I'll do something like, you know, sometimes I'm speaking like the teacher and I'm like, you know, I'm kind of some kind of authority here and you can <clears throat> trust what I'm saying. I'm kind of just reporting on things. Um, but in philosophy, so much stuff is, uh, is, I don't, this word carries other connotations, but opinion based in the sense that people have different beliefs and different perspectives about how to answer a certain question or whether something is true or not. Um, and so it can be really hard to completely like be out of it entirely, completely neutral, non-committal as an instructor. And in fact, I don't think that's the best um, type of teacher that you could have. Um, that's a little pedagogical thing. But usually in a classroom, <clears throat> I'll try to indicate when I'm like speaking as a teacher and when I'm just speaking as some person, as someone who like thinks about things and and um, and has thoughts about them and reflections to share. Usually what I do is I, I turn my hat to the side like this. So that's what I'm, I'm going to do this um, just to kind of indicate that everything that I'm saying right now is, is not anything I could claim on <clears throat> authority other than the, uh, the logic of the arguments I'm going to offer themselves. That's it. So I'm just offering these ideas as someone who has uh, wrestled with this problem myself. I mentioned that a little bit last time that I, I used to think that um, the whole process of of generalizing as a as a rational um, as a mode of reasoning, I used to think was inappropriate, um, and I've struggled with it some more. And here I'm just kind of reporting on some of my thoughts about it. And if you want to talk about it more with me, I would love to do that. Um, I still I still am feeling at this point in the quarter that I wish I had more contact with all of you, and I know it's it's harder to make it happen with an online class, uh, much less for for a topic that's just for fun discussion. But I'm definitely willing to do it. If you have the time and the space and you want to contact me, you can always call me. We can talk. We can do a video chat. <clears throat> Come to a study session. If there's nothing else to talk about, we can talk about that. But I think this is an important thing to talk about because issues around um, bigotry, um, prejudice, uh, stereotypes, these are things that really matter. And thinking critically about them matters even more. Um, it's the stuff that is most important that I think deserves most of our critical attention, even though sometimes it can feel like that's not the right idea, that the critical attention should be focused on the things we think are wrong rather than the things that we think are right. <clears throat> so in other words, we should criticize like people or systems that are prejudiced or um, bigoted or something like that instead of spending a whole bunch of critical attention on ourselves in making that judgment and whether we're doing it in the right way. Um, this is, I mean, this really comes out in um, ethics where it's like uh, most of your time is spent, uh, you, I, mean, I think most of us, this is, you know, in my experience, just ob observing people, most of our time is spent thinking about why we're right and not why we might be wrong. And with matters like ethics, things where the stakes are really high like, what is the right thing to do? What are the moral values that are going to get prioritized? And which ones are going to get deprioritized? And which things, like, does this thing even matter or not? <clears throat> In those debates, stakes are super high. Super high. And it's all the more reason that we want to be careful in thinking about our own thinking to make sure that we've got it right. And that we're not um, throwing blame where blame doesn't belong. Or that we aren't missing something that need, we need to be sensitive to. Um, <clears throat> or all sorts of things, how we explain stuff. That's kind of what I want to dig into here with statistical generalizations. So it might seem like, um, I mean, this is kind of how I imagine sort of an initial foray into this topic, that statistical generalizations are, here's this model of reasoning, and boy golly, it looks very, very similar to what goes on in a person when they develop stereotypical thinking. And we think stereotypical thinking is wrong and inappropriate, um, so maybe statistical generalizations are something dangerous and we should avoid them or not use them or something like that. Um, I think that's a, that, 
that seems like a, a decent argument for raising a, a concern that we should take seriously. I think under analysis, this again, right, this is just this is just me thinking about this more. I think under analysis, statistical generalizations are the wrong place to place the blame. That there's there's something like maybe inherently uh, offensive or bigoted about making statistical generalizations, or that if you want to avoid being a person with those characteristics, then you need to avoid statistical generalizations. I don't agree with that. I don't think that that's the, that's the right approach, and I'm going to try to give you some reasons why. My main argument um, is going to revolve around trying to explain how it isn't the statistical generalization part of a stereotype that is offensive to us, or that is morally problematic. Um, but rather it's based on something else or some other factors and I've got <clears throat> three different factors that strike me as uh, perhaps the most um, relevant things that our moral intuitions are uh, connecting with here and that I would I would think in principle are absolutely supportable as being major moral concerns so um, before I get into kind of those negative reasons I want to share a kind of positive story about how statistical generalizations are important if we um, if we care about the kinds of um, I'm going to use this word liberal values that would resist things like prejudice and bigotry that would reject them as saying that that's wrong. That's based on other positive values that we sometimes refer to as liberal values. And when I say that, I don't mean something like um, liberal versus conservative, like in American politics. That there are these two perspectives. What I mean by liberal values is just the kinds of things that I mean. Even you know, whatever side of the political spectrum you are in a, uh, here in America, um, pretty much everyone agrees that human beings have rights, and that we need to protect those rights, and that we have obligations connected with people's rights. I mean that um, that no one human being has greater moral worth than another human being in the sense that. One person deserves more to be happy than another person. We don't think that those things are true. Um, we might connect. We might make differences of judgment in terms of whether someone is more or less morally guilty, or has more or less valuable uh, traits to offer to benefit others or to benefit society or um, that sort of thing. But we think, in the matter of moral worth, of like. Um, whether your rights count for more than another person, we're like, no, that's not how that works. That's that's called egalitarianism. That it's like in the, when the Constitution says um, all men are created equal, and we are like, we should probably mean make sure that we're including non-male people in that as well. So we use man in a human sense, right? Um, Constitution has that, but that we're all created equal means that on a baseline level, no person counts for more than somebody else. Uh, as, uh, certainly when we're thinking about the kind of classic variables that people have um, thought that some people are better than better than others like issues like race um, gender uh, religious affiliation sexual orientation ability disability things like that we're gonna make um, we can make these other sorts of evaluations of people we're not all the same in every respect that's not true but we think when it comes to people's moral value that's the same that's all I mean by liberal values and that's why um, prejudice it's because of those concerns that everyone is sort of equal on this kind of um, moral concern level moral worth level and that it isn't based on these other factors that make some people count for more than others and we have human rights like that's the way in which we are equal it's not like we're all equal and not having any rights but there, there's moral concern that attaches to every single person. Every single person is valuable in that sense of being valuable equally. Those are the kinds of positive values that would lead us to see something like prejudice or bigotry as being inappropriate, um, that it gets in the way of those kinds of values. So that's all I mean by liberal values, or those kinds of thoughts. And that's something that I see people on all sides of the political spectrum in America agreeing with. Now, you know, we can... So we all have different um, moral blind spots, and sometimes we're not as um, uh, we don't apply those values that we all say that we have in a way that we all agree is the right way to apply those values. But um, and there may and there are some people who uh, come out and and don't speak in line with with those kinds of liberal values. But at this point in America, um, speaking in America and in American politics too. There is 
um, a pretty wide consensus for this being the only appropriate way in which we could think about things. The systems that we have do not perfectly reflect that value, and we don't perfectly live those values either. Um, but that'd be different than if, um, if our uh, society and our culture and our government was like explicitly like, no, white males do matter more than everyone else. And what they're going to, you know, and you might say, for all practical purposes, some of that stuff happens. And that is correct. But we don't have a culture that allows that to be explicitly endorsed in a widespread sort of way. And I know there's going to be people who might want to dispute this stuff with me and say it's even worse. And and I'm not a person to try to put a lipstick on a pig when it comes to this sort of stuff. There's a lot of work that we have to do, and there's a lot of ways that we fail to hold up to these ideals that otherwise we profess all the time. Um, but uh, but anyway, there, that, that's sort of the positive picture here. Um, these are the values that we care about positively, that we're trying to figure out how, what is the best way to, um, to live that out. And what does having those kinds of moral ideals mean for how we reason, specifically with statistical generalizations? Okay, so those are the positive values that would be why we would find something like bigotry, prejudice, or stereotypes um, problematic. I mean, you can see that there's a conflict there. But then what, is the, what are the factors that actually contribute to threatening those values? Is it statistical generalizations themselves? I'm not so sure. Here's another part of the positive argument. I got some friends who work in um, nonprofits in Seattle. And, and actually, there's one in particular that I have in mind here. Um, I have two friends, actually, who work at this nonprofit. It's called Landessa. And Landessa does um, a lot of research on behalf of foreign governments to inform them about what would be the effects of them changing some of their um, policies and laws. Particularly, there are two issues that Landessa focuses on a lot. Giving people who work on land ownership of that land instead of working for somebody else who owns the land, right? But giving them ownership of the land that they're working on. And two, education for women. Those are kind of the two issues that um, Landessa does all this research for, and then they, they give it for free to the government and be like, we did this research on your behalf. Here you go. You can look at here's how things would change and improve for your society and for your culture and for your, your um, country if you... Um, went about these sorts of policy changes, you made these opportunities happen. Uh, here's what you can expect. We've done the research for it. And they offer that free. <clears throat> They're not really lobbyists, um, but they see themselves as kind of putting it into somebody else's hands and giving them the tools to be able to consider that choice and see the kind of reasons and argument and evidence for it being a good choice. Um, and so um, in their research, they have to um, do a lot of statistical generalizations. It's just a ton of statistical generalizations. There's no way that they can go. You can go over to a country and look at every single individual case and um, figure out whether it has property X or not. Right? You have to sample some things um, and then make some generalizations about what's going to happen. And if they're if they're trying to argue to a foreign government that like look if you educate women you can expect that your GDP is going to raise by something something by whatever date I mean that's not something that they could ever provide that kind of total guarantee for it's going to be based on um, generalizations made from what we've observed in other cases <clears throat> so that's um that's an issue um, yeah, that's a that's a case of a kind of um, progressive project that really requires statistical generalizations in order to in order to actually work. And here's another case. Um, let's say we're concerned about inequality in our country, in our communities. In order to be able to figure out that inequality is taking place, we're probably going to have to use some statistical generalizations. So if there's, if there's some problems here, like how would we know that there are um, some major problems maybe with um, racism or sexism in our social institutions? Like say, um, how would you know whether there's some sort of unfairness going on with um, the legal system and prosecuting citizens for crimes? You're going to have to do some statistical generalizations to figure that stuff out. If there's some concerns about um, the direction that certain communities uh, in, say, Seattle are headed, and we might need to see how people are being treated 
relative to race, um, for instance, or religious background, or some, any of those sorts of factors that we're concerned about here with regard to equality, or we're, we're concerned about some kind of prejudice or some kind of bigotry. Um, we have to do some statistical generalizations to recognize that there's an issue here, to recognize where are the inequalities that are, that are problematic that we want to target and then do something about. So that's part of my positive case for statistical generalizations is to, to argue for how they're sort of instrumental in working for upholding um, liberal values. And again, <laughs> I don't think that that's something partisan. I think um, that there should be equal rights for everyone in America, that everyone should be playing by the same rules about that stuff is absolutely appropriate. That And anyone on whatever, um, whatever political party you affiliate with or whatever your political leanings are, um, I think there's a, a it's a pretty big tent to say universal human rights is something good. That brings in a lot of people. And again, there might be some people who disagree. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, like, you see my hat. You know, this is Tim Linneman thinking about this. So I'm happy to debate anything with you that you want to. And I will do it charitably, and I will respect you if you disagree with me. Um, so I'm just offering my two cents here. But here, here's what I think, uh, if that's a positive project, here's where I think um, the negative project, or the negative part of my argument in defense of statistical generalizations comes from. Um, so if uh, if it's not going to be statistical generalization, if I'm arguing that it's not the statistical generalization the part of things that's offensive, what how would I explain what's the problem with prejudice and bigotry and stereotypes, which are like the closest connection here? I think it comes down to three factors, and there might be some more here. These are just kind of the biggest ones that have come up in my personal reflections on this. Um, one of them might be how do we explain the, the generalization? So it might be a generalization that's true, but how do we explain it might be where things get offensive. So I, I asked uh, my students once, so like, give me a, give me a stereotype um, of what's going on, like a, like a, like a stereotype that you hear um, that, you know, it might be pretty offensive or whatever, but just, you know, give me an example. And um, one of my Asian female students said, Asian women are bad drivers. This is a stereotype. And so I'm going to use that example um, she gave me um, to work with this. So let's say we do the research. We do an investigation. We collect a sample. We investigate it. We interpret the, the data that we collected. And the evidence is, is in favor here of saying, yeah, Asian women are disproportionately uh, worse drivers. They get in more accidents, more serious accidents than other demographics. Let's say the data comes out that way. Is there something that is immediately offensive and problematic about that, drawing that conclusion, using that kind of evidence in that way? I would argue no, but there could be, depending on what are we going to do to explain the pattern that the statistical generalization has set as, as the conclusion. Maybe it's true that disproportion, I, I, don't, I don't really know, honestly. I haven't done the research myself, but let's just say, worst case scenario, let's say it's true that Asian women are disproportionately worse drivers. How do we explain that? If we were gonna, if the the most likely explanation is just connect the two things together. Have you heard like uh, correlation is not causation? That's what we're kind of talking about here. The fact that there is a pattern here to recognize doesn't mean that the one feature is the thing that is the cause for the other feature. And if we did that, I would argue, if we explained the generalization by saying, well, the reason the Asian women are bad drivers is because they're Asian and women. If that was the explanation then I think it just became bigoted. If you're saying like the reason why they're bad drivers is because of genetics or something about um, women biologically, this could start to get into, into more offensive territory. And in one sense I say it's probably just not true. Um, the other, the, think about the other ways that you might explain this. Let's say, let's say it's true. Let's say it's true that the pattern exists. That could be some very pertinent positive information for recognizing that there's some inequality here. Because maybe, you know, what are the kinds of factors that we generally think? Think back to background assumptions. What would make someone a better or worse driver? What would be kind of some of the factors that would help? I mean, think about when you learned how to drive. Um, how did you learn how to drive? Probably through someone else teaching you how to drive. What if no one was there to teach you how to drive? Would you be a good driver? If no one was encouraging you and giving you advice and going out with you every weekend to like drive around in the parking lot or whatever, if someone wasn't giving you that kind of support, you'd probably end up a pretty terrible driver, I mean, there'd be a risk there. Maybe the way to explain if that was if the, we saw that pattern, we're like Asian women worse drivers. 
maybe it's because no one's caring to try to teach them how to drive. That might be something that is like culturally repressed. That it's like, no, nope, women shouldn't be that independent. You know, we're not going to encourage them to develop the skills that will make them more independent and they can do things for themselves. Then that might be the real story of what's going on with that statistic, with that generalization. And we want to know about that pattern, if that pattern was real, to be able to do something about that, to say, like, look, no one's helping these people become more independent and be able to take care of themselves and do the things that they got to do to live. There needs to be that support there, and we're not we're ignoring that. That's a moral blind spot for us. That'd be something important for us to know. So I think I think the first way in which things can become bigoted or prejudiced, or that where we have the offensiveness that comes into a generalization, would be maybe how we explain it, how we explain that it's true. That's one thing. The second thing that I think where generalizations become can become morally problematic is not based on the generalization itself again, but about what we think it means what does it justify in terms of a response so if we think the go back to this example with Asian women being bad drivers if we're like oh well Asian women are bad drivers therefore we shouldn't let them drive if that was the response then that would be problematic right that would be something um, to be concerned about so um, so I think you know number one how we explain the generalization that's where things could get dicey and what we think the, the the response that's justified based on that statistic, that's where things can get dicey. Back to, I mean, even in my first example, I was like, you know, one of the responses to knowing that Asian women are bad drivers might be to be like, hey, that's a sign that they're not getting support, so we ought to give them support. We explain it by saying not something like, well, it's because they're Asian women, but it's because no one is caring for them or that they're not, it's not culturally um, as acceptable or maybe even positively they're culturally repressed to being independent. So let and then so that might be on the level of explanation. But on the second level, it'd be like if that is information that I then use to try to do something to advocate for their justice and equality, right? If I take that in a kind of social justice way, then that'd be a good response. So based on what I do with the information, that might also affect the moral outcome here. So hopefully those two things make sense. The third one that I have in mind is this, and I and this this gets a little closer to the structure of a statistical generalization itself. No one's really concerned when we're making statistical generalizations about things like uh, whether a new medication is harmful or helpful. You know, we got to do some studies, run some experiments, or if we're doing statistical generalizations about like stars in the galaxy or something, no one's going to really be concerned about that. But there might be a concern about using statistical generalizations about certain types of objects, people, right? People, you, me, those people, those people, everyone around us. If we're, if we're making statistical generalizations about people, there might be a concern here. And what would be the concern? There's a bunch of different ways to articulate this. Um, and again, I'm, I'm trying to keep this somewhat short. <laughs> but um, one concern I think might be this. Uh, the concern that we use statistics as a that when we, if we're, if we're thinking a lot in terms of statistical generalizations, then when we encounter a person, there's a person right in front of me, that I just see them as an object of statistics and I don't see them as an individual because an individual can break a statistical generalization and still have that statistical generalization be true it might be true that 99.9% .9 of blah 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 or blah 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 but then there's that 0.01% that isn't that way so if I'm allowing my statistical knowledge about you or what you what sort of categories you fall into to override um, or overcome or prevent me from seeing you as an individual person for what is individually true about you then that could be morally problematic to treat people like statistics is morally problematic and I completely agree with that concern I mean that's a real moral concern we dehumanize each other and ourselves constantly we always are trying to use and a lot of them are like statistical sorts of things uh, or impressions or perceptions um, to find the meaning in ourselves and other people and I think that's problematic um, we are individuals and even if we have tendencies we can make different choices um, even if there are ways in which we are affected in some way versus another we can go a different direction we've got we've got some some degree of freedom here to exercise uh, and that needs to be respected that we are autonomous individuals that are self-determining and to treat everyone that way 
think about uh, oh man I could I could lecture on this forever this is gonna get into ethical territory very fast and I need to be careful about how much time I spend on this but if you want to talk to me more about this I would love to this is like my main jam I'm um, talking about the ethics of reasoning it's like all my favorite things all at once um, <laughs> so uh, there are um, when you when you think about the people that you're closest with that you have close relationships with um, you know about their tendencies you know a lot about their tendencies but you also appeal to them as people who make choices that you may not just treat them as um, as uh, an object of causal determination or as statistical categories because you you have some rapport with them there's some way in which you can say hey would you be willing to, I know this isn't what you normally like to do but would you be willing to do this or what do you think about this idea I know it's not really your thing but hear me out you can make those kinds of appeals to people because they can make choices to do what they're going to do but if you're afraid of people or you don't have rapport with them or you don't have a relationship with them then you don't really know what to expect out of them and so the mind starts looking for ways to understand and control the situation without having confidence about being able to reach out to them as a person with freedom as an individual and that's where we might get tempted into using statistical knowledge like statistical generalizations to come to conclusions about people um, that and we don't give them the chance to show us what they're really about for themselves or to make choices or whatever to respect the choices that they have actually made um, so that's a concern completely agree with that concern but again I don't think that it's something that is intrinsically problematic about statistical generalizations um, the the thing that I would argue here is that if I'm going to do the sorts of things that we would understand as part of having a relationship or creating that rapport I need to be able if I like things like listening if I'm going to listen I need to use things like statistical generalizations to try to understand like where people are coming from like the background assumptions that I bring to the table which largely are statistical generalizations but I've kind of learned oh these things are kind of like this thing or that things kind of like that thing that kind of information is really useful in helping me listen and respect and understand you as a person all of us are still causal beings we're still connected with this kind of conditional world we're not just free beings we also have these other parameters to us we come from certain backgrounds we've had different experiences and those have shaped what we are and causal generalizations help us to understand that kind of realm so it informs again I would say the problem here when things go wrong is when we don't allow the individual person to we don't listen to them for how they are we're not sensitive to the possibilities of how they might not fit into the things that are generally true of people in their category or something like that that would be important um, but think about when you're trying to get to know somebody um, or you're trying to help someone understand you you start appealing to certain things that you're like I think you probably already have some background knowledge. You've got some generalizations from your experience that this might help you give an idea. You'd be like, "Oh, I'm the kind of person who likes Star Trek." You know, I've got the Star Trek shirt on. I'm like, "You want to know Tim Linderman? Yeah, I'm the kind of guy who likes Star Trek." I mean, and then you like, "Oh, we've got all these generalizations about people who like Star Trek." Um, but then I might say things like, "Except on this thing, you know, I'm like, I'm like a lot of people who like Star Trek, except for this, right?" Um, or man, I have this conversation when it comes to religion all the time because. Um, I'm I'm I've told I've told all of you before I'm I'm Christian and Buddhist together. That already is kind of weird sometimes. People are like, how is that supposed to work? I get that question a lot. Um, but when I say those things, I mean there's so many different th generalizations that people have that pop in their head. They, uh, again, you might say stereotypes. But what's the line between a stereotype and the kind of generalization that's useful for listening and understanding? It's not always easy to tell. But I think a big factor here is about the willingness of someone, if they're going to get to know me, that they'd be like, okay, so Tim said that thing, but it's possible that, you know, I've got some things to connect with. It's possible that he doesn't make those connections the way that I make those connections. And to be open to that, to be looking for those possibilities, and to let the choices that I make as an individual speak the most to how to understand who I am, I think that's the most important part. And so I was using me as an example. I'd say the same thing for you. If I'm trying to respect and understand and listen to you as an in, and respect you as an individual, that means I'll bring some background assumptions to the table. 
but I'm going to be looking to about what I directly observe with right in front of my face and what you say about yourself and what you the kinds of particular experiences that you've had to let that be the strongest evidence that I use in trying to understand you rather than the statistical generalization but I think the statistical generalizations can still play a part of that process this is a balancing act. I, I hope I've been able to articulate kind of the position that I'm defending and I and my arguments for it well, um, and and I've been able to make that that whole thing clear. There's a lot of subtlety here. There's a lot of balancing act sort of stuff. So um, I wanted to share those thoughts with you. I feel like this is a topic that I couldn't just ignore. Um, I wanted to speak to it, and it it also it's been a little while since we've uh, connected this sort of dry critical reasoning skills stuff, the analytic principles, with something that's like you know, meaty and about humanity and stuff like that. So I wanted to do this. Um, I hope you're considering that. I mean, I spent a half an hour talking about this. I hope you consider this a um, useful use of your time. Um, I mean, I usually spend 50 minutes in a class period, and then so everyone's hostage in the room. Well, you're hostage on YouTube. I guess you could have skipped it if you didn't like it at the beginning. But um, I hope this has been good. And if you want to talk about it more, I would absolutely love to do that. Again, this is just... Uh, I'm trying to think about this and, and respect a bunch of different things simultaneously, and this is my best effort. This is kind of the position I'm at. So far, this seems like the best one, but maybe there's something more for me to learn. Maybe there's some things I'm not taking into account or things that I need to be putting a little higher on my radar, and so I'd love to continue the debate. I don't think it's an easy question to, to figure out um, how do we hold our patterns of reasoning ethically accountable. Where could be the problems? Where are the things that we should be keeping an eye out for? What is, uh, you know, thinking is an activity like anything else that we do. And we can do it ethically and we can do it unethically. There are ethical things having to do with thought that we should think about. And I'm not talking about thought crime the way I've heard some people concerned about, like, thought policing and stuff like that. Um, even if it would be wrong, and I do think it would be wrong to have a big brother state where people are thought policing each other. I don't think that would be good, like some kind of you know, cops with telepathy running around being like, oh, I saw that thought, you know, and then carting you off to jail. I don't think that's right. But it's still important for us to recognize that thinking is one of the most common uh, activities that we're engaging with, and our thinking directs a lot of our action. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And how we're thinking can be very important for how we're acting. And so there's, there's a lot of, that is morally at stake with how we think. So thinking critically about thinking with an ethical lens, I think is super, super crucial and important. So I'm happy we were able to take a little episode to do that, and I'd love to do it more with you. Um, I, I am not a perfect saint, and I, I'm trying, <laughs> and I'd love your help if you have some disagreements with me, and we can we can have some debates about it. It'd be great. So I'll leave it at that. Let's start talking about... Let's start talking about statistical applications now um, and get some more material down. So, let's pull up the lecture notes again here. So, statistical applications are very similar to um, statistical generalizations. And, in fact, all the stuff I was talking about for the previous half hour applies to statistical applications, too. Um, you know, so if, if generalizations are how I, I, I look at a, spe a few specific cases and then I generalize about a whole, what's true of a whole category, when I'm walking around with those, with those generalizations, the knowledge that generalizations have given me, um, I will apply them into some new situation to try to get knowledge about it. So I use like, what do I, what do I, I have some general knowledge about bus schedules in Seattle. And that has been informed by lots and lots of experiences on the bus, knowing which buses tend to be on time, which ones tend to be late or not show up at all, or uh, on certain days they have different schedules. That knowledge that I have about generally what's happening with buses in Seattle is informed from particular experiences I've had in the past. So that's a generalization. But now that I've got the generalization, I don't just sit on it and be like, yay, now I know these general things about the buses. If, in order for that knowledge to be useful to me, I have to apply it into like when I'm going to get on the bus and say I'm planning on doing that in you know about an hour. I need to use the knowledge, the general knowledge and apply it into a particular case. And that's what statistical applications are. So when I draw the picture, I'm going to draw another picture like I did with generalizations. It's going to look very similar. But the direction of the inference is going to be different, and there's some other slight differences that I'll need to, to speak about. And they're definitely different with how we evaluate them and how we figure out whether this is a strong application or a weak application. will be different from how we're doing that 
with generalizations. Um, but let's take a look here at an example. Or, or let's do the definition first. So a statistical application is an argument that makes a claim about a particular subset of a reference class, we're talking about reference classes again, by citing claims about the reference class. So here's like a, a general format for it. X percent of F's have the feature G. A is in the category of being an F. Therefore, A has the feature G. So I'm actually going to use my terminology in giving an example here. Okay, let's give us a title. Statistical applications. Yep, there, okay, that's fine. All right, and then we need to do some. We're going to have some circles here again. And you know this is our this is our reference class. Oh, I didn't want that to be underlined. And then this now we're going to call you know before we called with the generalization we called this the sample, and that word seems appropriate because in a generalization you're sampling the reference class to see what's up with it. But now it's it's really the same thing structurally. It's exactly the same thing structurally. We're just going to give it a different name um, when we're talking about applications. We're going to call it a subset this time. Okay. I'm actually going to move, move this up here because I'm going to, we'll, we'll do both sort of side by side. Similarly as before, there's going to be a property X here that's going on. So uh, let's get that in here. Property X. But this time, instead of... Um, using what I know about the smaller category, that the smaller category has this property in order to infer that the um, larger category, the reference class, has that property. Instead of doing it that direction, now I'm using what I know about the reference class to make a judgment about what is happening with a subset category of that reference class. And that subset could involve, it could be, um, you know, just a single case. So like in my bus example, I'm like, I have all this general knowledge about buses, um, but really uh, I'm going to apply it to just the case that's about to happen next in an hour. I mean, that's a, that's a really um, small subset, but it's still a subset. I'm, I'm just drawing the therefore symbol here in case you're wondering what that is to indicate that the direction of the inference is from the claim that the reference class has a certain property to that the subset has it, whereas with the generalization it was the opposite. Um, in fact... Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing there. Totally messed things up. Let's actually copy. I'm going to make a, another copy of this because I want to show you the um, contrast here between statistical applications and statistical generalizations. Wow, whoa. All right, so here are applications, here are generalizations. Um, and it's a little different with a generalization because um, the inference is going in the opposite direction. And we call it a different thing. So we call this a sample instead of the subset. And let's just get that arrow pointing in the right direction. There we go. Oops. So, generalizations go from a claim about the smaller category to saying that the larger category has that property. Applications go the opposite direction. And there's a kind of a new thing here. Um, this is the way that the book draws it. I will use the same thing. Um, there's going to be discussion of a kind of percentage um, going on with an application that isn't necessarily there with the generalization. Although, I want to impress something on you very crucially. One of the things I'm going to have you do on the exam is I'm going to give you a statistical argument and you're, the first thing you're going to have to do is tell me whether it's a generalization or an application. Okay? So you're going to have to tell me the difference. In every quarter, I have a bunch of students who because of this feature about the percentage thing being connected with the application think that, well, if there's a percentage involved in the argument, that means it's an application. Not so. 
think about the last time we were talking with generalizations. I was saying, you know, 60% of Americans believe in some form of gun control or something like that, right? I was like, I was saying property X could be a percentage. That could be the, the ratio of something having the property. That could be property X. And it, so it could be a generalization. So that's my that's my advice. That's why I'm getting really close to the camera and being like, be be careful about this. Don't fall into this trap. Just because if there's a percentage involved it does not mean that it's an application. Could be a generalization. However, every statistical application will have some kind of ratio or some sort of percentage. All right, so let's go back to this. Um, so we're, the the argument is going to say as a premise. A certain percentage of the reference class has this property so therefore it's likely not guaranteed but it's likely there's good reason to think that a subset taken from this reference class will also have that property I, I've got an example I like for this let's say you got a bucket of marbles and it's got a label on the front and it in the, the the bucket is opaque so you can't see what the marbles you know that are inside the bucket you know, it's not transparent. Uh, it's got a label on the front, and it says, Now, with 90% blue marbles, if you were going to reach inside that jar and pull out one marble, what would you think it is? What do you, you think? If you trust the label, you say, I've got some good reason to think probably going to get a blue marble if I pull out one. The one that you pull out, that's like the subset. The bucket is like the reference class, and property X is being blue so we'd be saying 90% of the buckets in this mar uh, the marble the, mar the buckets in this marble the marble in these <laughs> the marbles in this bucket are blue they have that property right so chances are a subset will also have that property um, okay you might say uh, yeah yeah okay never mind so I don't want to make things more confusing so that's um, that's a good example here of a statistical application and how it works um, if you wanted to, let's say you wanted to make the opposite sort of thing, so the, you don't know how many marbles in the bucket are blue, um, you don't have that, the label's been ripped off or something, you could pull a handful of marbles out of the bucket, find that they are 90% blue, and then conclude that 90% of the marbles in the bucket are then going to be blue. And then you'd have a statistical generalization on your hands. So generalizations and applications are, are kind of, you know, they're just two different row, uh, directions on the same street. Uh, another metaphor I like to use in those kind of weird is it's kind of like breathing. The way that we reason with applications and generalizations is like this in and out, in and out. We're constantly, you know, collecting our experiences, trying to get some general knowledge off of them, making generalizations, and then taking that generalized knowledge and applying it into new situations. And this is cycle. It's a big part of how we learn from experience, what learning from experience looks like, and like I've mentioned before, how science is done as well. What's, a, what's good is a bunch of um, scientific laws as general knowledge unless you apply them into the next situation that happens. If you're like, well, I just know what's true in the past, but who knows what's true in the future? And it's like all that knowledge of the generalization is basically worthless. Uh, there's actually an interesting philosophical point about this in David Hume, but I'm not going to open up that can of worms. We've had enough uh, cans of worm opening for today. Okay, so before this lecture is over, we got to talk about how applications are evaluated. Hopefully the structure of what makes an application what it is is clear. Um, by the way, I'm always happy to say these sorts of things. On the exam, I've already mentioned how I'll be giving you some applications and generalizations and you're going to have to tell me which is which. But there's a few other things I'll be asking for. I'll also be asking you to identify for me what is the reference class regardless of whether it's an application or a generalization. And I'll be asking you to identify for me what is the subset or the sample. And I'll you know I'll say subset slash sample because it's just two different names depending on whether you thought it was an application or a generalization. But identifying what are these, um, what are the two categories of things that we're talking about is actually uh, something I'll be asking you to answer on the exam because it is super crucial to get everything in the right spot for the last thing I'll be asking you to do, which is to evaluate that application or generalization using the standards that we have for evaluating that type of argument. So you have to tell me whether it's strong or weak and why. So before, uh, in our last lecture, you know, we went over all the standards here for generalizations. 
sample size, sample bias, bias in investigation, bias in interpretation. Those are the four things that we talked about for how to evaluate a generalization. Well, there's going to be different standards for an application. There are two um, that I'll talk about. And I'll, so you'll have to um, apply those standards to evaluate the argument. And that will mean a long form answer. You'll write like a short paragraph to basically tell me, here's how this argument is stacking up against this criteria. I will be giving you the criteria on the exam. So you don't have to have it memorized. I mean, it, I guess that makes less sense for an online course because you've got your notes you can look at the whole time that you're working on the exam anyway. So it's not about that. Getting, knowing the standards and just what their words are, I won't be testing you on. And I won't be giving you credit for based on that sort of thing. What I will be giving you credit on is the quality of your explanations. Whether I can see that you're applying the criteria in your evaluation in a way that lets me know that you know what it's all about. This is the kind of thing I was describing in my last video, and that's the same thing that's going to be happening here when we talk about applications. So what are the standards that we use for applications? Let's take a look. So the, the first one is is really, really simple. It's about the percentage cited in the premises. And even though it's worded this way, what are the percentages? When you're answering this question on the exam, you can't just tell me what it is and that's it. I want you to be telling me whether that means the argument is strong or weak. That's a that's another trap. I, sometimes students just put down, they're like, oh, the percentage was, you know, 72. I'm like, okay, so what does that mean? Does that mean that the argument is doing good or is it doing badly or like what's going on here? So that's another thing to keep, keep an eye out for. So... Uh, let's go back to our, our little picture here. If the reference class, let's go back to the bucket of marbles thing. If you know 90% of the marbles in the bucket are blue, then chance is pretty good for it to be blue, right? I, th that a subset. If I pull a single marble out of the bucket, that it's going to also be blue. If the if this is close to 100%, then I can make this inference pretty well. Let's say the percentage was like, you know, now with 2% blue marbles. If I know that there are only 2% blue marbles, then I can make a different sort of claim about the, as a conclusion. I could say, uh, it's probably true that the marble I'm going to pick up, the subset, is not blue. That it doesn't have that property if only 2% of the, of the bucket of marbles has that property. Okay, so if the percentage is really close to 100% or to 0%, then we've got a strong application. If it's closer to 50-50, if it's in the middle here, the closer it is to that, the weaker the, the, the statistical application is. So if I got a bucket full of red and blue marbles, and I know it's 50 red and 50 blue, then if I pull a single marble out of the bucket, do I have any good reason of thinking that it's blue rather than not blue? No, I don't. It's basically a toss-up. It's a coin flip. I have no reason to go one way or the other. Okay, So statistical applications are stronger when the percentage of the reference class which has the feature is really close to 100% or to zero. That's going to be the best. So um, so that's the first standard. And all it really, explaining your answer here is basically to tell me what is what is the percentage. I mean, that still is required. But then to just talk about it, to evaluate it, um, letting me know that you know that it being closer to 100 or to 0 is better and it being closer to 50-50 is bad. That's it. There's all. There's not too much more that's conceptually difficult to explain there. The really tricky standard is the second one here. Um, is the reference class chosen the most relevant for determining whether the subset has the claimed feature? Okay, um, to talk about this I'm going to do some more drawing, but first thing we should probably note about this is in cashing out what the standard means is that it's talking about relevance. You already had to make this kind of judgment when we were talking about sample bias. Remember I was saying that to recognize that there's sample bias means there's not just some way in which the sample is not representative of the reference class. There's something going on with the sample that's not going on with the reference class like um, being uh, I only talk to banana lovers and figuring out whether what their thoughts, what Americans thought about gun control. So not all Americans are banana lovers, so that's not representative. That was only part of it. The second part was that that feature that's different, whatever is not representative, needs to be something that would be relevant to whether or not something would have the property in question. That's the other kind of key thing here. So um, we, you know, we made the judgment 
or I made the judgment, I guess I didn't talk to you, uh, you weren't a part of it, but I made the judgment in the last video lecture that being a banana lover is not really relevant to what someone's thoughts about gun control are. So that shouldn't really be considered sample bias. But something like if I only talk to members of the NRA, that would be relevant for thoughts about um, your opinions about gun control. So that would be sample bias if I only talk to members of the NRA to figure out what Americans think about gun control. So uh, making a relevance judgment is something you've had to do before. It is a thought, but it's an idea we've had, but now you're thinking about it in a different way. So let's talk about that different way. So going back to our pictures here, I'm actually going to... Um, well, I love these pretty pictures I make, but I'm going to get rid of them. Okay, so let's... And give myself some more space here. All right, and I'm going to use a different color this time. Green seems good. So, you know, when someone was making this statistical application, they chose a particular reference class that they're using to get straight on the subset. Like before, we were like looking at the su the sample to get guidance about the reference class. Well, now we're we're seeing that the fact that this subset has membership in this reference class is a reason for thinking that something is true of it because of what we know about the reference class. Okay, so we're we're choosing a reference what we know about the reference class to give us guidance about this particular case, the subset, whatever it is. Okay. But we didn't have to choose necessarily the one that we did choose. Okay, so you know I used green last time to show to draw about things that you have to think about in evaluating it. At any given subset is a member of like a bajillion different reference classes. I mean there's so many there's so many different categories that anything would fall under, and it should be more like that, right, like this. Um, let me give you an example. This is one of my favorite ones to use. So let's say, um, you know, it's early in the quarter, uh, and I walk into your classroom, or you see my first video lecture, and you're like, okay, is this guy going to be a good instructor, or is he going to be a shitty one? Because I've had good instructors and I've had bad instructors. I know not all teachers are good. Like, is this is this is this guy Tim? Tim is he going to be a good teacher or not? Now, you know some things about teachers because of the teachers you've had in the past. Certain categories. You're like, oh, Tim's a Cubs fan, Ugh. or he wears glasses, or you know he's white, or something. Right? There's all these factors. Or I'm younger, or I um, I'm ex I'm excitable, or um, not very funny, or whatever it is that's true of me. I mean, I'm in a ton of different categories. Um, I like the demographic thing. I mean, um, I'm, I identify as Christian, but I also identify as Buddhist. And I've got glasses, and I'm white, and I'm male, um, and I'm under 40, and, you know, they, there's all these different categories that I'm in. And maybe those categories, um, you know, you, you've learned some things about what is generally true of things in those categories with respect to say a property X like being a good teacher or not is you know what's going to happen with that um, so you might choose one of them to be like oh well this this one I'm going to use as guidance for this to for getting a choice uh, to get a judgment or to draw a conclusion or to see I've got some evidence for whether Tim is going to be a good teacher or not but some of those things could be more relevant to look at than others um, if you've ever heard about the phrase statistical cherry picking, that's the kind of thing that we're worried about here when it comes to is to you know go back to the lecture notes here, is the reference class chosen the most relevant for determining whether the subset has the claimed feature? So let's let's just say um, you've had I don't know let's say you've had um, ten instructors. Who um, who are all Cubs fans? This is this is actually perfect. Like you've had ten instructors who just happen to all be Cubs fans, and they were all terrible instructors. Just every single one of them was a terrible instructor. Um, and then you you come to this class and you see, oh, Tim's a Cubs fan. E. I think he's going to be a terrible instructor because. 100%, right? What's a better ratio for a statistical application? This, you know, it's not even. 90% or something. It's like 100%. 10 out of 10 of these instructors I had that were Cubs fans were terrible instructors. So, man, that's a really good reason to think that Tim's going to be a bad instructor. 
And that looks good when it comes to the first standard, but it doesn't look so good when it comes to the second standard. Because what's the connection here between being a Cubs fan and being a good teacher? To make that judgment, you have to use your background assumptions. You have to think about, what do, what, what do I know about sports and fans and what is a, a good teacher and a bad teacher? What could, how could that be explained? I mean, is, is there a, a relevance of connection between these things or not? Just like with, you know, being a banana lover and uh, your opinions about gun control, like the only thing our imagination can come up with is like, banana kind of looks like a gun. You can kind of hold it like a gun. But I don't even know what that would mean. So it's like, there isn't a connection of relevance here. How would, how would being a Cubs fan translate into, you know, not having the kinds of skills or attributes or temperament or character that's important for, for being a good instructor. And even if there is some relevant connection, the standards are also asking for what is the most relevant. So you have to think, what are the other kinds of categories that could be more important? Um, it might maybe energy things are important or how informed I am uh, or how accessible I am as an instructor. Maybe those things are a little more important. For whether or not this is going to your judgment of whether this person is going to be a good instructor or not so um, when you're evaluating the second standard you have to do a lot of outside the box thinking here you can't just work on what the problem gives you you have to think about like all the stuff in green here is stuff you need to think about it won't be given there in the homework problem or on the exam you have to be asking yourself is there some other reference class that would be more relevant for figuring out whether something has or does not have property X that the subset could be included in? Um, and that's how you'll make that judgment. So those are the two standards for statistical applications that I'll need you to um, use when evaluating them on the exam uh, and in the homework. So. Uh, just to kind of finally, uh, and then I'll, we'll close down this video, and next time we'll talk about uh, causal reasoning, which is a fun little game too. Um, but the uh, that'll be a totally different type of thing. Um, but to close this off, I want to remind you that for both statistical applications and generalizations, it's going to be very important. Um, I'm going to be asking you to remember the kinds of things I'm going to be asking you to do on the exam to kind of prepare in the right way for this. One, you'll have to know the difference between the two. What is a generalization what, and what's an application? And it depends on what sort of direction the inference is going in. In order to figure out whether it's an application or a generalization, you really do kind of need to answer first the other things I'll be asking. What's the reference class? And what's the subset or sample class? If you can figure out which is which and figure out which claim is the premise and which came, claim is the conclusion, you'll figure out what direction the inference is happening in and you can tell whether it's an application or a generalization. Once you've got all that determined, now that'll also tell you what set of standards you need to apply to that particular argument to figure out if it's strong or weak. Are you going to use the standards for a statistical application or are you going to use the standards for a generalization? And they're different. And you won't be using both for any of them. You know, you'll, you'll only use the criteria for a good generalization when we're talking about generalizations and applications for applications. And when it comes to answering those questions, if you have to do this on the homework, I encourage you to practice it this way really explain your evaluation. Don't just tell me what your evaluation is. Don't just log your judgment, but you have to walk me through it. Show me how the principle, when applied, in this case, in this situation, returns this result. That means you're going to have to bring up your background assumptions. You're going to have to explain your reasoning to me. Walk me through the steps in your thought process that caused you to say, it's doing a strong job, it's doing good, it's a weak argument, it's not strong, it's doing badly, or it's sort of okay. You know, if you make those kind of, I don't care about which one you choose. What I care about is your explanation. Again, your answers might be different from my answers, but if I see your explanation and I can see the, the criteria that's the same for both of us here, like is the reference class chosen the most relevant, you understand what it looks like to apply that principle in that situation properly, then I don't care if we have different background assumptions, I can still give you full credit. Even if we make different determinations as conclusions, I can give you credit if you're explaining yourself well here. And and like I said before, um, you know I've I've strived um, I strive to make the homework problem or the uh, sorry the exam problems um, more clear cut. You know um, not super layups, but 
you know, that make you have to think, but that if you have the principles, if you know the principles, you know what to look for and where to go looking for it, um, you'll be able to find the answer. That it'll, there'll be a kind of a clear answer that that principle will speak to. Um, so, but you know, things can happen. You know, I, I always get surprised every quarter with answers from students and thinking about them in different ways than I do. So that's fine. That's why I need you to explain the answers, and that's probably the most important bit of advice I can give you. So you'll be writing like little short paragraphs. Okay, let's close down that this lecture. Um, I'm going to be doing everything in my power to try to get more of these lectures up over the weekend. This week has been really rough. I'm recording this on uh, the morning of the 11th, um, Friday the 11th. So. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, I I wanted to have more material up faster, um, but you you know you can be reading the textbook and and looking over some of the homework problems um, while and sort of following like I said kind of follow along with my video lectures as we go. Um, do exercise. Don't wait to do all the exercises at the end. Now that we've gone through the kind of chapter eight material on statistical generalizations and applications, do those exercises. Don't wait until we've done everything else. Um, you can do that right now. This is going to be kind of like mini modules in this one big module. So um, that's it for this video. Uh, hope to see you again soon. I, I should have. I'm going to try to get another video lecture even recorded today. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But um, hope to talk to you soon. Again, as always, let me know how I can help you more. All right. Bye.